Good to see everybody. God bless you. If we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. A lot of great stuff going on with the announcements a little bit earlier. Hey, Desiree, was that you yelling about the chili cook-off just a moment ago? Oh, I'm glad it was actually Jazzy because I was going to remind you that she beat you last year. She whooped you. She took home the prize. <laughs> it's a lot of great fun. If you've not been here for one, I encourage you to come out. You know, even if you're not um, going to participate in the competition portion, come out and be a part of the fellowship. Bring a little bit of chili and enough for everyone to share. It's always just a great time hanging out with uh, friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. So today we are going to continue on in our message series entitled, you know, Second Priority. What are some of the second priorities? We know that God is supposed to be the first priority in our lives, don't we? Everybody remember that? You know that as a believer? You understand that one, right? So I'm going to ask the ushers to lock the doors for just a second because we're talking about money and I don't want everybody to run out. I am just kidding, you know, but don't, don't run out on this message. I think God really has something to say to you and I, I uh, I think I'm going to present it in a way that I've not presented it before. I, I've I presented on this topic probably 50, 60 times over the past 20 years. And uh, one sad universal truth, if I were honest with you, is probably most people didn't put into practice the things that I talked about. So my biggest prayer today would be that people would hear what we're saying. You know, my message has been consistent. Prepare, plan, Follow God's path for your finances individually and in your marriage. And I pray today you'll see that in a new light. And if, if that's not part of your story, that it will become part of your story. I'm not going to talk too much about a ton of practical like to do, like, hey, this is where you save your money. This is where you do this because um, there's a lot of great teachings on that, some far better than I could ever do. But um, back in 2019, I did a eight-week message series entitled The Great Escape, and it was all about those kinds of details. So if you missed it and weren't here during that season, you could look on our Facebook, you could look on our YouTube channel and on our app, and you could go search for Great Escape, and I have no doubt you'll find that message series. There's also great resources that you could be directed to like Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University or even this upcoming Saturday, all of you couples are going to sign up, right, for that class that's occurring next Saturday morning on marriage and money. It's an important topic. I encourage you to go be there. They'll give you some real practical things that you could put into practice. I'm going to really try to focus on the biblical foundation of what we're talking about today and current events. So, Father, I come before you today in light of this series that we're in, and Lord, would you truly be that first priority in our life? Without that, nothing else really matters, and nothing I'm about to say matters, Lord Jesus, but if you are first, then all of the things will begin to fall into order, and Lord, our heart's desire is to please you, to worship you in every area of our lives, especially in our money, Lord God, for it's a big barometer of where our heart is. Lord, we can't thank you enough for your presence this morning, your power to touch and change lives. Holy Spirit, I ask you to continue to work in and through our hearts and minds as we study your word today. Would you use it to transform us, change us, and make us more like you? In Jesus' name, amen. So one of our jumping off points uh, for this series has been Matthew 6.33. It simply says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, make the kingdom of God your primary concern, and all these things will be added unto you. But we never really talked about the verses that preceded it much, right? So I want to talk about that a little bit today, because obviously scripture needs to be taken in context, right? You need to read it in context of where it's at. It's a great standalone verse in and of itself, though, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are these, all these things that need to get added unto us, right? So if you go to the beginning of the book of Matthew chapter 6, um, he lays out a few things which I really think should be the lifestyle of a believer. He says, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast, so start to chalk that up right now. I'm going to ask you to think a few times right from the beginning and examine yourself in light of Scripture. If it were to be your epitaph day and they were going to write something about you, would those three things be high on the list? Would you be known as a giver? Would you be known as one who prays fervently? Would you be one who know, who's known as one who fasts? Obviously, that one's not on my agenda at the moment. Come on, Jesus, help me out in that third one, right? 
but an important one. He's laying out the lifestyle for which a believer should be engaged in. There's distinct things that he calls us to. So I ask you yet again, are those the kinds of things that characterize your life? If not, why not? If not, would you be willing to dive just a little bit deeper into God's word? Would you be willing to seek out the Holy Spirit and ask him to change you and transform you? I share these things with you from the jump because Matthew 6, says in another rendition, make the kingdom of God your primary concern. I believe that is first and foremost. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you are in this room, we live in some dark times that are about to get darker. Things are getting really rough out there. When I first started talking about messages on preparedness 15 years ago, I felt that we had a long runway before us in which we could continue to prepare. I don't know that I feel the same way right now. I almost feel like it could be too late. The birth pangs continue to increase. The challenges that keep coming upon our world continue to get greater and greater and greater. And when it comes to our finances, you're either going to live it out God's way or you're going to live it out the world's way, right? And when you see what the world has to offer in this message, I don't think you're going to want to go there, right? But if you're not living it out God's way, if the kingdom of God is not your primary concern in every area of your life, as Pastor Adam shared a little bit earlier, I pray that today God would impress upon your heart the nature of the times in which we live and that, man, you would put him first in every area of your life. If you scroll down a little bit further in Matthew chapter 6, you get to verse 19, the middle point of that particular section of scripture. And this set of verses stands out. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust destroys and whether thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'll do verse 21 in the Eric Jaffe Revised Standard Version. Show me your bank statement and I'll quickly show you what's important to you. Show me your bank statement and I'll quickly show you what's important to you. It tells the story of what's important to us very quickly when we look at our bank statements, does it not? Obviously this verse is more about than just our bank statements, right? It has a lot to say about other things. If you put God first, where your treasure is, your heart is, if you're serving in the church, if you're serving in your family, if you're advancing the kingdom of God, there's a lot of things that dwell far beyond money, right? And those things are very important, but today we are diving into that money aspect of it just a little bit to really grasp what God's trying to say to us here, right? See, there's this tension in God's word that I sensed in the spirit even as we were worshiping earlier today. There's this tension between our spirit, or God's spirit, and our heart, and between the world and our hearts. One of them is winning out at any given point in time, right? But the stronger that we can get in the spirit, the less the world holds to us, right? The less it can grasp at us. That's the tension that we're experiencing. So a couple more challenging questions as we go on today. Is the kingdom of God really your primary concern? Is it really first and foremost for you? Think about it. I know as Christians, we all say it is, but if it's not, this is an opportunity to, Lord, help me, change me. Lord, I truly want my heart and my life to line up with the action so that everything is in one accord following after you in these dark days that we live in. Is the kingdom of God first in your finances? Yes, sir. I heard one amen. Yes. I heard two. Amen. Hey, y'all know I can look at the church statements. Don't you know that, right? <laughs> I don't, but I could. <laughs> but I can tell you statistics tell a different story oftentimes. I can tell you that's the truth. and It's a sad truth at times, but it's true. So I'm just being honest with you. Or has the world crept in and God has become an afterthought, especially in that area of your life? I don't know the answer to those questions. You do. If you need to repent, it's okay to repent. We're all here. We all need to grow, right? Come on, Jesus. Would you change us? Would you transform us? Would you make us more like you? Those verses really matter. Matthew 6.33 really matters to our marriages. Matthew 6.33 really ma matters in our individual lives. It's one of my life verses. I love that particular verse. 
If you read on just past 6.30, or almost as you approach 6.33, there's another verse. Matthew 6.24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Money, obviously we know what money is here in the United States. It's the U.S. dollar, right? Mammon is a demonic spirit that sits behind money and corrupts it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later in our message today. But it's a very important that we understand it. You cannot serve both God and money, right? Greed will kill. But not just in our generation. Greed might not even be the challenge that we're facing right now. I mean, with all the things that I'm about to share with you, it's very hard to even barely get ahead. Would you agree? It's a challenge right now. It's a difficult thing. And we're going to either trust in the finances of the world or we're going to trust in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as our provider. Anything that takes first place between you and God is an idol. You need to go to war against the idols in your life. You need to slay them. You need to overcome them. There is this demonic spirit called mammon that uses money as a way to steal worship from God. So what is one of the primary uses of money in our lives supposed to be? It's supposed to be an instrument of worship unto God. The first time you really see it in the Bible is in early chapters of Genesis, and I'll show you where that is. Right from the beginning, the fruit of our labor, the things that God puts in our lives are supposed to be an instrument of worship to him. If the devil can keep you broke, busted, disgusted, if he can keep you from a lie of not giving God first in your life, he steals resources from the kingdom of God so that God does not get the worship, and guess who gets glorified? The devil, right? It's all about worship at the core. Who do you worship? The next verses between 24 and 33 talk all about the things that we fear as human beings. I'll paraphrase it for just a moment, but how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to afford my clothes? How am I going to afford to walk in and out of Publix without going broke? The things that weigh deeply on our heart, and a lot of those are financial in nature. But in verse 33, God basically says, silly human, again the Eric paraphrase, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What he's saying, he's going to take care of our basic needs. He's going to be there for us. You can survive and thrive in the midst of a world that is crashing around you. We sang about this stuff and rejoiced about it just a little bit earlier. But when the storms are on the horizon or when the storms are overhead, guess what? You can still thrive if you're operating under God's economy and not the world's economy. Can I get an amen? Do you believe the word of God? Most of you, right? (laughs) Yes, we do, right? He's laying a promise out there right before us in his word if we will only seize it. And that's where I share so many times as a pastor, you get up and share things. People say they believe it, but then they don't put it into practice. We read these things, we say these things, but experience tells me we don't put them into practice. We need to put them into practice. Um, I love current events. I used to not love current events when I was a kid, like studying them in school, but today I do. Let me share with you a few of the things that we're experiencing right now in the world at this particular moment. The times that we are living in, especially as it pertains to finances, are unprecedented in the natural. We're at a moment in our history and our country where the world is in turmoil. The debt crisis that our, you know, that our country faces right now is insurmountable. They throw around things like, we are $33.5 trillion in debt. You read something like, like, what is that? Like, how, how do you even fathom what a number that big possibly even is, right? But if you start to break it down just a little bit more, the magnitude of that number is incredible. The magnitude of that number is $100,000 per U.S. citizen. But guess what? Not every U.S. citizen is a taxpayer. That is 259,000 per taxpayer. Do you think that could ever be repaid? No way, no how. No way, no how is that ever gonna be repaid, which starts to lead into a question that I'll answer in a moment. 
how do they end up getting rid of that historically? And it's not a pretty, pretty sight. The inflation crisis. The current administration and really every previous administration tells us inflation is under control. One trip to Publix will tell you all the difference, right? And yes, Publix is on the higher side of things. So one trip to Walmart will still tell you the difference, right? I mean, you go in there to buy food. We all know that those numbers that they give us are a lie. Hate me for this, but your government lies to you people. Sadly, I would love to be patriotic, but our government lies to us. I'll give you more examples of that in just a moment. This is just one of them. But, you know, we were facing a publicly declared 8% inflation not long ago, about a couple months ago, right? 8% inflation. Did your paychecks go up 8%? None of y'all? Come on now, right? 8% inflation. Now they say 2%. Do you know that 2% is incredibly insidious in and of itself? Why 2%? So here's how they came about that 2% number. They felt that the society was dumb enough to not feel the impact of 2% where you wouldn't get mad and do a Boston Tea Party. I'm dead serious. They felt it was a number that was low enough where they could continue to print money and attempt to keep it low like that where you would see like that frog boiling in the water, you would think nothing's wrong. But guess what? If you put your money in the bank 10 years from now, it's only worth 80 cents on the dollar. That means 20 years from now, it's worth 60 cents on the dollar. 30 years from now, when you get ready to retire, it's worth even less, right? So by the time you retire, you're lucky if whatever you put in your 401k still has the same buying power it did. Because guess what? They operate on what's called fiat money today. It used to be our money was built on gold or silver, right? So I brought a little bit of that with me today. Here's gold, right? You can't print gold out of thin air, right? You can't do it. It held governments back. If they got too far extended like they did during the Vietnam War, what ended up happening is even some of our allies like France said it was redeemable. The dollar was redeemable for gold. And they said, you guys are printing far too much money. We don't think the dollar's worth what we say it is. We want the gold. So what did America do? We said, oh, we're gonna stop redeeming gold for dollars. We're gonna stop redeeming gold for silver. Back in the day, you used to have a silver certificate, right? You would be able to go exchange your dollars for silver. You can't make this stuff out of thin air so it held governments in check. This is God's money from Genesis chapter four. All the way back, human beings have seen this as God's money. So they did something called fiat money. What does that mean? Fiat means by decree. You will accept this money or else. That's what it basically means. We live in a debt-based economy now. We live in a debt-based monetary system. They print money out of thin air to pay the $1.7 trillion of debt that they accumulated last year. Do you know that since 2020 at the rise of COVID, they printed 35 to 40% more money into existence than all of history before that? When everybody got your stimulus checks, you were super happy about those stimulus checks, weren't you? We were happy for them at the time. But guess what? There's a delayed reaction. Then two years later, all of a sudden, inflation is at 8%. And then you got to pay more for everything for the rest of your life. They lie to you. They rob from you. They're of the devil who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. If you operate on the world's economy, you will get destroyed. You cannot. It won't work out. May I continue on? Gas prices. Hey, Jesus, that affects all of it. You mean y'all ain't got your electric car just yet? Oh, we can go into that one too. Stink for one moment. Okay. Gas price is an issue. If, you know, batteries are toxic. So what happens when every single one of us is driving one of those cars with the batteries that are toxic? Where do you dispose of that stuff? You think another crisis is in the making about 10 or 15 years from now? They're going to be saying, no, we need to switch back to gas or so. I don't know what they're going to do. Sorry, I got off track here, but <laughs> everything's a lie. I'm here to tell you, everything's a lie. You can hate me for it, but you're going to believe me later. Yeah. Housing prices are the least affordable for the average American in history. In history. I'll use our old house as an example. 2020, we were blessed to buy a home for $150,000. Brand spanking new 
Eagle Harbor neighborhood, absolutely amazing for the kids. Everything was great. I looked up that house on Zillow and I wish I hadn't sold it. Come on, Jesus. It said it was going for 395,000. 395,000 in 20 years. And now guess what? The mortgage rate is 8% now, right? If you go to get it. So I look back at our old payment, which was like $1,250. Come on, Jesus. To get the same house today would be almost $4,000. And that house is now 23 years old. Tell me something ain't broke. The devil is a liar. He's trying to kill, steal, destroy, enslave all of mankind. This is part of his plan. You can't operate under his economy. Y'all like to drive those cars we talked about just a little bit earlier? I need to get water. Hold on. This is getting me there. We fired up. Average new car price. Anybody want to venture a guess? 50,000. Whoever said 50,000, you took it home. You must have been looking at the statistics in the current events a little bit earlier. Average car loan, $745. When I was coming up, you could get a car loan for three years and maybe your payment would be $300. Now it's seven years at $745. Insanity. Do you think it's the prices of everything are going up or do you think it's that they're printing money and that it takes more monetary units to get the same things that we used to do? They hate you. I'm telling you, they hate you. Health insurance. Whoo, Jesus. Beyond ridiculous. A family of four, over twenty-two to $2,400 per month that your company pays for insurance if you're employed. If you're not, you got to pay for it yourself. That's more, I'm, that, that is, to, to baseline, think about maybe some of you in here, I'll go to the opposite and we're getting ready to retire. Okay, if you retire and you don't have Medicare or Medicaid just yet, guess what? How can I, have, that, that's 24,000, that's more than I made when I first started working. $24,000 just for insurance. Impossible. So I, I share these statistics with you because we're at a place where This is one of the first generations where it seems like you're going to have more obstacles that they got to overcome. Previous generations, it seemed to get better for every next generation. And that's not the day and age. Why? Because the devil is in control. Even the most avid Dave Ramsey practitioners are having trouble making it with the seven baby steps. Luke 21 says, there will come a day when men's hearts will fail them for fear of what they see coming on the earth. And that's the day and age in which I think we find ourselves. There's a song that went viral not long ago, a couple months back by Oliver Anthony. It said, Richmond, north of Richmond. You might've heard it. I think in many ways it's an anthem of our day. Like five foot three and you're 300 pounds. Our taxes shouldn't pay for your bag of fudge rounds. That's the craziness of the world we live in. Is it not? These rich men north of Richmond are evil. These politicians for the most part are evil. It doesn't matter what party you're voting for. I'm here to tell you, it's coming up again. There are two sides of the same bird. You can get mad at me if you want. We're not supposed to talk about politics, but none of them are stopping it. None of them are saying stop it. None of them. They're warmongers. They want nothing but death, death, and destruction. In the natural, things are not looking good. Would you agree? It's an imperative that we live our finances God's way more than ever before. So what's going on? I hinted at it. The devil seeks to kill, steal, destroy, and slave. He puts evil men into positions of power in government and corporate America and pharmaceutical companies and the military industrial complex and then they rule because of their greed and then they steal and enslave entire populations and that's the place in which we're starting to find ourselves. Ultimately, the devil wants to corrupt our hearts regarding money again so that it cannot be used as an instrument of worship. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith to their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Let me give you yet another example. There's a show on Netflix, you could watch it, called The Pharmacist. 
very interesting pseudo documentary. Like they, it's basically historically correct, but at the same time they use characters in order to create it. And it's the story of how Oxycontin became legal here in America. It's a crazy story, you know? How many of you know the death, de death and destruction that's come from Oxycontin, right? Death, debt, and destruction. Completely sanctioned by the United States government. They created the largest drug dealer in the world so that they could get the money, so that people could get rich. Go watch the story of it. You'll be absolutely blown away. That's one of many stories like that where you'll see a institution like the pharmaceutical institutions that has all this money that goes and pays off all the lobbyists and everybody else so that they can get positioned to go sell a drug that is incredibly highly addictive, that has killed more people than any other drug that's on the street, yet is easily allowed and able to buy because it's a pharmaceutical. This is the world we live in, people. I share these things so that you can grasp and understand the true nature of where we find ourselves. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter four, if you've been around for a while, you've heard me share this. Just as the snake crept into the garden and tempted Eve, the demon Mammon came in and whispered in Cain's ear and convinced him to sin by not giving his first and his best. And Cain fell into that trap, right? God comes to him and says, Cain, why did you not worship me? I'm not accepting your offering. I'm accepting that of your brother Abel. Why did he do that? Because he fell into the lion trap of the devil. He wanted to keep that which is his. He wanted to hold it back from God and not worship God in spirit and in truth. And God rejected that. If you're here and you're tipping God, I'm here to tell you he's rejecting it. Don't even give that tip. If you're not worshiping God wholly with your finances and putting everything before him and saying, Lord, this is yours. You're the one who gave me the ability to create wealth. Lord, you're the one who birthed me. You're the one who gives me the ability to breathe. Lord, I give back to you because it is yours in the first place. That's the attitude he's looking at in there, right? So when I come to these conclusions about kill, stealing, and destroying, and demonic powers and principalities like mammon being behind what we're seeing going on in the earth today, I stand on good grounds biblically. It says that God ends up cursing the earth. He curses mammon into the earth. And then you go to Revelation chapter 13 to the end of the Bible, and it gets to that verse that we all like to talk about in the end times. There'll come a day where you will have to take a mark where you'll not be able to buy or sell lest you have that mark. And it precedes that in verse 13 and it says, this being, mammon, comes out of the ground that was cursed and he rises up with such power that you will not be able to buy or sell lest you have the mark. This is the day and age in which we're living. Why are all these financial systems so corrupt? Because the demon mammon is in full control. The only thing left is to release the central bank digital currency that you hear them talking about. A digital currency where you will have a social credit score. And if you don't abide by what they want you to abide by, they will limit your ability to buy and sell. If you don't agree with the politics that they want, you might not be able to buy and sell. And ultimately, if you don't agree with the religion that they want and worship who you want, they're going to lock you out. And then what are you going to do when it comes time to have food for your family at that particular day and age? Church, this message is not all hip, hip, hooray here, right, so far. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Read to the end. It says there's these birth pangs that increase with intensity until that day where it says, look up. Have hope in the midst. When you see all of this craziness, have hope because it means your redemption draws near. That Jesus is coming around the corner. We live in the day and age where they have the ability to make it so you can't buy or sell without this. We live in biblical times. We live in times where there's a war going on in Israel right now, right? Where the whole world is fixated on what's going on. Is this the Ezekiel 38 moment war or not? I do not know, but it certainly draws clear, right? Near, those birth pangs are happening. And guess what, I hinted at it a little bit earlier. When an economic system is about to fail, what do the rulers do? They always take you to war. They always take you to war. They're warmongers, why? Because the devil or mammon works in conjunction with another spirit called Baal. And just as Cain ended up killing Abel, Baal wants to kill 
steal and destroy to honor and worship their father, Satan, every single time you see the same thing happen. We're on, why do you think they want another hundred trillion billion whatever dollars for Ukraine and what's going on in Israel right now? Because they need to reset what's going on and push in and usher in this era of CDBCs where you can not buy or sell without that marked church. We live in biblical times. You better get excited. You better get ready because there is an antidote to all this madness that is found in God's word. There's an antidote. We read it earlier, Matthew 6, Make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Put God first in your finances. I don't have any incentive here. I'm not on staff to tell you to tithe, but I'm here to tell you to tithe to your local church. Give over and above. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, God says some things that seem crazy. I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he's purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. I asked you earlier, I'll rephrase it, do you trust God to take care of your needs? Do you believe his word to be true? If you do, then why don't your checkbooks line up with what I'm saying today? Bottom line is, who are you going to worship and what are we going to teach our kids? Are you going to fall the same way as Cain did to the lie of mammon whispering in your ear? Or are you going to be like Abel? A lot of areas of discipleship are very difficult to measure. Money is not. <laughs> not that we're going to go ask to see your checkbooks in any way, shape, or form, but you can look at them yourselves. It's easy to see if someone gives generously or they don't. And Journey, I challenge you right now, right here to live generously and I have great hope because I was gonna go use one of those baskets as an illustration and they're gone. Because Luke 6.38 says, give and it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, it will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Pinky, can I borrow yours for just a second? You get that that basket. What does that verse really mean? Does it mean you're going to have all kinds of money? You You know what I started thinking about when I did it? Think of the story with the fish and the loaves. It started out of lack. They didn't have enough to feed those people, right? They had a few fishes. They had a few loaves. What this verse is about is if you put God first, that same kind of miracle can happen. No matter what your lack is, if you give out a lack, that's more faithful than giving out of abundance, right? It's like, boom, you give it out. Oh, there's, wait, hold on. What? You know, there's more. Lord, how does it keep staying there? Lord, how, how do you have enough? How, how do I still have enough for me? Not that I'm all rich, not that I got all the stuff, but I got enough that I can continue to eat. All my needs continue to be met. If we believe God's word, would we trust him in that? Would we be people who are generous? Would we be people who are giving? God's ways are better than our ways. Matthew, Malachi chapter 3, test me in this. See if I don't open up the storehouses of heaven on your behalf. Lord, put them to the test. Mary Jo and I have tried to faithfully give all our lives from the age of 22 until today. And I can say with all confidence that God has supplied all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So much so that he's not only taken care of just our needs, but he's given us some of our wants as well. But one of the things that I've lived by, I have a saying is you got to give it away to keep it. It's in line with that verse that we did. I I always say that you got to give it away to keep it. You know, and I I ask God like, Lord, I don't have all the money to do it, but I want to give away money. I want to keep doing it. Do you know that this year we started a foundation as we were leaving it? This isn't all our money, but God brought people alongside of us. This year I was able to give away $278,000. $278,000 to build water wells, to help with with orphans and widows to help with a variety of different causes. God will put money in your hands to be able to give it away. It even says in the last days, there'll be a great wealth transfer where God will transfer wealth from the wicked into the hands of the righteous. Not to those who are going to accumulate it for themselves, but those that are willing to give it away so that other people would do it. I see those moments come true in my own life. How the heck could I give away $278,000? How's that even possible? 
But God trusts us because he knows that if he gives it to us, there's no overhead for that. We give away every single penny of it. Somebody gives us money, we just give it away. And then every single time he meets our needs. I can't explain it. It sounds counterintuitive. How do you give it away and end up with more? I don't know, but it's true. Yes. I can tell you that. Yes. I've seen it happen over and over and over. So maybe you didn't grab a basket a little bit earlier. That's okay. You don't need a basket to participate in it. But would you do something outrageously egregious of God, like, Lord, I just want to make a difference. I trust you. I know that if, he, if you're calling me to give it away in whatever that way is that you're going to sustain, you're going to refill it back up. And every time he does, every time he does, would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, I suspect that this isn't the message that they thought they were going to hear today, but Father, I...